everybody it's me yes I wear glasses so hopefully the reflection won't get you because I have the curtains open behind you today we're talking about spinning wheels which is why we have our friend right here and previously on my channel I had put up a video about a great wheel which is a much larger version of a spinning wheel and I forgot to tell you about this little friend this happens to be a flax wheel. And don't necessarily let that name fool you. Um, I've been spinning wool on this little flax wheel for well over a decade. And I'm kind of also doing a little bit of a project reveal for everybody today, which is going to be that I'm going to be making another project that is spun, woven, and then turning into clothing. And I wanted to show you kind of a general idea of what that was going to be, which is why there's this fabric right here. This fabric is woven. One direction has one color. The other direction has another color. That's why you're getting differences in shadow here. Uh, let me see. I can kind of tell you which direction is what here. So for this fabric, the warp, which is what is strung right onto the loom directly, the warp is gray. The weft, which is the horizontal part of the weave, is black. So we have a gray-black combination. I kind of hope you can see it. Let's pull that in front. And this is a hand-woven piece of wool. My goal is to make several bits more, but a little differently. Next to me right here, what this is, is a bag full of wool. So just kind of like the nursery rhyme. And what I have in here for you today is I have basically those wonderful reusable shopping bags. This is full of a really pretty brown color. Like, um, not quite camel brown, more like a chocolatey brown. You can kind of see it there. And then I have another one that has gray. Now this bag actually contains gray and black. So that's more of a gray color, kind of like the fabric that you just saw. And I also have black in there. So pretty much what my goal is, is to make this kind of fabric completely on my own. I'm going to use my table loom, which is not going to produce a very wide bit of fabric. But my idea with this is, making this, is that medieval looms were not necessarily as wide as we would like, so to speak, unless you were making fabric on a commercial level. So my idea is, is that this would be kind of like a cottage industry for somebody who was able to get it and then sell the fabric to someone to make clothing out of it. So project update. The other reason that I have this wonderful creature out here is to kind of show you the parts of a spinning wheel in a little bit of a brighter atmosphere. Um, last time I filmed my great wheel, it was kind of in a prior place that I lived and it was kind of stuck in several different spots and not easy to move, even though I, I did show it on the video. So if you wanna learn more about a great wheel, which is normally used to spin wool, then you'll want to check out my um, videos. I have Great Wheel Part 1, Great Wheel Part 2, or in the prior videos. But this creature is a flax wheel. And what a flax wheel does is it has some different parts to it than the Great Wheel does. Mainly what you're seeing here. This is called a distaff. Basically, you would tie on your bit of flax tie it on to this portion, it would drape, and then you could draft off of your distaff 
which would then allow you to be able to spin. Now, right now I have just a bit of wool here. This is like a, a long mohair type of situation. And there are parts to the spinning wheel that one would need to know, as well as if you were to buy either an antique wheel like what this is, or if you wanted to buy a brand new spinning wheel, there are companies out there that do make brand new spinning wheels and many different features. I know Ashford is one of the companies, this is not a sponsored video by the way, but Ashford is one of the few companies that does still produce spinning wheels. Their version that looks like this is called a castle wheel. And what you basically have here is the disc staff. This is normally the part that when you're buying an antique wheel is missing because these were traditionally buried with the spinner. So that tends to be something where the disc staff you don't always find intact. Or if you do find a flax wheel that does have their disc staff with it, you're going to pay a little bit more because it's pretty much a complete wheel. For myself, I had to buy quite a bit of parts to make this work. Um, luckily, when I purchased this, this was one of the first things I got after joining the SCA was a spinning wheel because I love fiber arts. I love the look of this and I enjoy wool quite a bit. So it was nice to be able to create my own yarns, ply them, either weave them into something, knit or crochet them into something. It had, to me, more uses in and out of the SCA as compared to maybe some other handicrafts. This also led to the adventure of not just learning about fiber, but making fabric and then consequently making clothing out of it because if you're producing all of this different materials well you want to get some use out of them after all let me put away my bits of fiber i have a cat just off of camera and she's over here sniffing the wool besides the br pretty brown color i showed you there is a tawny camel color. So I'm going to make basically a dark brown with a light brown and then a black and a gray and then hopefully make them into some sort of clothing. More likely some fitted jackets again because they don't take up too much yardage as far as a actual garment goes. A lot of the kirtles take about three to four yards worth of fabric which on a very narrow loom is a bit more difficult to produce the amount that I need for the skirt. But jackets and smaller items that are about two, maybe three yards are much more manageable. But anyway, let me just move this fabric here. Besides the distaff, you have what is this part right here is called the mother of all. What this does is this actually, this portion right here moves back and forth by this crank that's on the end, which controls your tension. When you are restringing your drive bands, what you're normally doing with this is you put this portion all the way down to the bottom as far as it goes. You tie these on and then you crank this back up. That creates tension on these, which allows them to spin. Let's see here. I have some ends on here because when you tie them, you have to create a knot. And these knots are kind of progressively getting looser. I might have to find a pair of snips for them later. Then you have, of course, the wheel. This one has two channels on top. There is basically one portion goes to the end of my one part here, and then the second drive inner drive band hooks onto the end of the spool. This allows both of them to spin at the same time and allows the spool to spin independently and allows basically as you spin the yarn you create 
then gets drafted onto the spool as the tension progresses. A lot of these tend to have leather pieces at the end, like right here. I used a metal piece to make this workable. I might find a way, a better way of removing this and putting another leather loop back on here, which can be cr controlled with tension and would still allow the spinning wheel to work. But this was a, a fix that I had done very early on just to make the wheel workable because without this end, this entire portion in the middle here, this would be loose and could fall off. So I needed to have some way of securing it and it to have a bit of tension. So yes, this is the mother of all, which basically moves back and forth. And then they call this portion the maiden, which this is the work portion of your wheel where you actually are drafting on your your yarn basically and um, spinning wheels do single single ply normally is where you start and then you would create double triple ply yarns eventually as you get practiced and twist is important whether or not you're creating the twist going clockwise or counterclockwise. Right now, when I drafted this on, I did it counterclockwise. Most of the time, I go clockwise, but I was also trying to put a little bit of yarn on here so you could kind of see what's going on. And while I was setting up my spinning wheel, I did something off camera that's very important. Oil, yet again. Um, I oiled right here, basically, on both ends. There is a metal spoke that goes through the center of your drive wheel, and I oil that. This is basically wood, so the wood will eventually just continue to soak up the oil over time. I also oiled the end of my pin that's at the end of my maiden. I oiled in between my spool and this other end of my bait in there that has the two draft pieces. These are just cotton, by the way. This is just cotton yarn that uh, you can find in just about any hardware store. I like to get it because it's fairly cheap. It has a little bit of stretch to it. Um, it's a little thicker than the cotton cooking yarn that you find. So this is something that has just a bit of thickness to it because I want it to hold up over a period of time. If you make it too thin, these drive bands can snap. It's very unusual to find a spinning wheel that has drive bands on it. And most of the time those are our replacement ones. These just would have been yarn that the person who owned the spinning wheel would have tied around to make it work. Fairly, fairly simple if you want to think about it in, in that way. We're not talking with high technology here like we do in our modern day life. So what I normally do is I do this barefoot. Reason being is I like to feel what I'm doing. And this is the treadle down here where my foot is. And there is this draft bar right here. Now some spinning wheels you'll see will not have this bar, but they might just have a string attaching this to the end of the spoke, which this is like a, an iron, like a dark black iron kind of piece. And um, what this is, is this is attached to the treadle pedal by a piece of rawhide. A lot of the flexible pieces were leather. And even some modern new spinning wheels use leather. Sometimes they use metal or plastic. Um, I try to, if I do buy a piece, I try to keep it fairly original if I can. 
just because I want it to look and function the way that it would have back in the day. And if you ever do see me at an SCA event and I have my spinning wheel, this is the one that I will bring with me. This is the one that is much easier to port around. I can put this in the back seat or the passenger seat of my car and go. My great wheel, as wonderful as it is, and it is just a wonderful and beautiful piece of technology, is not as easily portable. So with these smaller spinning wheels, this is what I recommend. As far as travel goes, these are much friendlier. Right now it's trying to draft on what I've already spun. And that's one thing you want to avoid is your yarn going backwards or trying to spin around the other direction. I caught that so I was able to pull it back out really quick. And what I sometimes do, especially with a new spool like this where I haven't put a lot of yarn on it, I'll manually feed it in. It doesn't hurt to do so. The trick with spinning on a flax wheel is they're meant to go really fast. And wool is not meant to be spun as quickly as flax. It doesn't need to be turned as tightly as flax does. So the trick if you are spinning wool on a flax wheel is this is going to draft a lot quicker and pull in your yarn a lot faster. So you need to be aware of and keep an eye on your yarn because what will eventually happen if there's too much tension on your yarn and it tries to curl around itself, that's the sign that the tension is getting too high and that if you continue in that same situation, it's going to it's going to break on you is what will eventually happen. And getting a snapped yarn as you've gotten yourself already already started is a bit frustrating. The wool fibers keep sticking to my band-aid, so I'm better off just putting it in my pocket and going forward. And sometimes with my wheel, I'll do what you're seeing here, which is just pull the spokes and not necessarily put my foot on the treadle because I'm still trying to create a certain amount of twist. And what's, what this is trying to do is catch itself on the hook. Now, sometimes it'll create inconsistencies in my yarn as well, where I'll get thick and thin pieces. So you do want to be careful about that, especially if you're trying to create a very consistent yarn. Like right now, this did not twist this piece very well. So I am going to hold on to it and let it twist first. Because if it creates a very loose piece of yarn, it's going to fall apart eventually as I'm trying to work with it. And everything I'm telling you here is something that I've learned over time. This was the spinning wheel I learned to spin on. So I've gotten acquainted with her over quite a period of time. I started in the SCA when I was 21. I'm 36 right now. And so she and I have had a very long-term relationship. Let's put it that way. So it was very frustrating for me, a real test of fire to learn to spin on a flax wheel. Um, it made me want to give up several times, but I knew that it could be done. 
it's not the easiest way to learn a skill. And I learned other skills after getting this wheel, uh, specifically, specifically drop spindling and other older forms of spinning fiber. So what happened was is this thinned out and I'm gonna have to redraft off of my spool. And I have my trusty little tool here. I like to twist this in on itself and create a little loop. Push it through the orifice, which is the little hole right ahead of where the hooks are and push it through and then re-hook it back up to one of the hooks. And then what you do is you're drafting back on your bit of fiber to an already spun piece of yarn. So what happens with this basic spinning is I reopen the end of the yarn, release some of the twist basically because I'm gonna retwist it to get it back on and create one piece of smooth yarn again. So the trick is this really wants you to get it away. It, it wants to draft and quickly draft it on and get it onto the spool. And you're basically holding it in your hand, pulling on the tension and saying, oh no, you don't. You're only going on to the spool when I tell you that you're going on to the spool and not before. Now it's gotten thin at this one end again, so I'm gonna actually draft off of my spool and pull it back through the orifice before anything breaks. Practice as you can tell. And it's undone itself a little bit. And you can do quite a bit of twisting with your fingers. Because you're basically controlling the amount of twist itself and the amount of yarn that's there to twist, which creates a certain amount of thickness. Even, even without not having my foot on the treadle and I just do this, it's trying to draft the yarn onto the spool right away, which is some of that noise that you're hearing. That's the drafting onto the spool. Now I'm holding back. I have quite a bit of tension on here because I want more twist in my yarn. And what happened there is that the wheel decided, okay, then I've created too much twist in that area and it broke my yarn. So. Spinning is not always as smooth as, as what everyone makes it out to be. It takes a lot of years of practice to get really good at it. So don't get frustrated if it doesn't work out the first time around because more than likely it won't unless you have a lot of beginner's luck. Now this spinning wheel is actually made out of several different kinds of wood, believe it or not. The body of the wheel, the wheel itself, the outer edge, the spokes on the treadle pedal, those are all made out of oak. They're very heavy and they can put up to quite a bit of, I guess the best word would be wear in this case, abuse, unfortunately it can be a term too. 
Um, this wheel is probably at least 200 years old. It does actually have, believe it or not, the name of the maker is actually burned into the body of the spinning wheel, actually right here. And uh, I tried to research and look up who the maker was, but I did not ever find any information about this person. Let me see what the name of it is. S. Reiner, R-E-I-N-E-R. -E so if you know anybody who deals in antique spinning wheels and they know who S, as in Sam, Reiner is, let me know. I doubt though that we even really know who that person was and why they were making spinning wheels about circa 200 years ago, but hey, Everybody's got a hobby, right? Well, most people do anyway. Just trying to make a bit of a thicker piece of yarn here. Not make it so thin. I tend to make stocking weight yarn, which is pretty thin by all technical standards. So making a thicker yard, yarn for me is a challenge because I unfortunately let things get a bit thin. There we go, this is a bit nicer. The tricky bit is also not allowing it to go back on itself. Sometimes it's better just to stop the wheel if it's getting away from you and let you control what's being drafted onto your spinning wheel. I didn't ever find the name for what the uprights are, these wood pieces here that hold on onto the wheel. I'm sure there's a name for them just like anything else. I mean, you, you pretty much have three legs here uh, these are made out of maple, actually. That All the turnings on the inside of the wheel, those are maple. And then all the turnings here for the mother of all, they're made out of maple. I'm not exactly sure. I think the maiden is also, that's the portion that has all the hooks on it that are on opposite sides. It's called the maiden. That looks like these are all maple turned pieces. A lot of the spools are pretty beat up. Um, many of my spools, hold on a moment, tend to have chunks missing out of the ends of their, they're still usable, but what you have to worry about, see there's chunks here and here, and there's a little one off of the end of this. With the, original spools you have to worry about with these chunks missing slippage more or less where the drive bands try to slip out of the little groove that they're meant to stay in and these can become fragile over time so that's another situation that you want to be careful about is that you have good spools. I have some replacement ones that I bought off at Ashford that do work on this wheel really well. Um, I had to kind of cut down the one end because it was a little bit big, but they do fit. So I can actually get quite a bit of yarn. I have a basket that I keep just my spinning supplies in. Um, I have Ashford spinning wheel oil. It again, the video is not sponsored, but this basically has, it's non-staining, high grade, and it's fairly convenient. They have 100 milli, milliliters? Um, Ashford's out of New Zealand, so you will be dealing with like an exchange rate. I also keep these little bamboo forks. You can also use toothpicks. I put them in the ends here because there's basically a little hole up above the steel rod that goes through the wheel 
and this keeps the wheel from hopping and jumping around that there is something over those holes as well as I use them right here to hold on the end of the distaff. My father made this end for me and we uh, stained it to somewhat match the rest of the wheel and then this portion is original. Even having this upright Part of the distaff is unusual so I was very happy that when I purchased this wheel that it at least came with the upright and my dad could match the beads in the pattern of the wood to be able to create a new distaff for me. Besides the oil I normally keep my little hook tool to help get the yarn back through the orifice that's normally in in there and I've been purchasing a whole bunch of cedar rings that you can kind of get at Walmart in their laundry section and what I do with cedar because insects don't like it um, I put it in my yarn I put it um, in my baskets and other items trying to basically keep any possibilities of something getting in my fibers to ruin them. Uh, I also keep sort of extra ends available that this portion right here, this end that has a separate groove in it. This has two grooves, this one has one. I keep those, just put this in here with the spools. And then in my basket of spinning, I also keep, this is more of that cotton string I was telling you about that I use for drive bands. I keep a whole roll of that in here, just because in case it tends to be a bad day and the drive bands don't want to agree, well then you have everything you need in one spot. So I have some several dedicated baskets like I have my sewing stuff is in one area my fiber arts things are in another area the the weaving and fiber arts things tend to stay in the same relative area because they're related but uh, I have a whole fluff of white yarn here and I have actually not just this I have an entire tote this is kind of like a, a long mohair like yarn or wool so to speak well I really hope that you enjoyed this video today and if you are interested in more fiber arts related videos please let me know I'm hoping to eventually make more videos in regards to weaving at some point I haven't set up my floor loom since I've moved for the sake of space more than anything as you can imagine because uh, a lot of my items either stay in the basement or have their own little dedicated spot as well as trying to keep the cats out of everything is its own challenge as you can imagine. Please consider subscribing to my channel. I try to up upload new videos twice a month. And if you have any questions, of course, leave them in the comments. I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. If you're trying to troubleshoot getting a spinning wheel or loom or antique sewing machine, um, I'm more than happy to answer questions that might come up or if you had any um, requests for particular videos, I'm more than happy to look and see what options we have available. I really appreciate you watching and I hope you have a great day. Bye!